Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda YouTube podcast series. We are here again in partnership with our platforms freedomx.com that you're going to be hearing quite significantly as our new metaverse platform that is going to be public in the Canadian Securities Exchange in the near future. And we have as well, of course, the partnership with openbusinesscouncil.org, our business directory, and as well citiesabc.com, our cities and platform for marketplace for the cities and data around cities around the world. So this series always portrayed the visionaries and the people that are changing the world, especially in the areas of technology, where we're proud right now that our YouTube channel right now is in, one, in the first 1,700 in the world. But uh, we are as well aiming firstly to portray people that are doing a change, whereas uh, with the areas of technology, but as well, how we can actually bring these tools of our times to improve society and create better narratives. And that's partly what we do in this series. We think about and we listen to people and we share ideas and we talk about the challenges and the opportunities that we're facing. So today, I welcome to our series, Lars Rottweiler, the CTO and founder of MBank, um, which uh, it's a very interesting project that you're going to be highlighting. And Lars is uh, quite a, a big personality that with 25 years in business, um, and as well with a, a, an international recognized expertise in banking transformation, and as well as a distinguished influencer and thought leader in digital banking, fintech, crypto banking, and blockchain technology, uh, all the major areas of financial and as well business in our times. And um, about this project, uh, uh, so uh, Lars, with, along with Vladimir um, Lunegog, uh, they founded MBank in 2017, and MBank is a fintech company which sets and operates banks for clients using digital banking platform um, on the software as a service. And um, is proprietary technology has been creating a modular end-to-end -end banking platform with everything required for instantly launch financial services for multiple different cases. Before founding MBank, Lars was managing director of Deutsche Bank, and then the senior executive roles on PwC before that, Accenture and Infosys. And his extensive banking and technology industry background is built on top level engagement across the world, which I think it's one of the areas that we portrayed a lot on this. And um, his kind of uh, achievements are quite substantial from a keynote speaker in some of the leading global um, conferences as well in terms of being involved with leading universities and uh, holding as well uh, different um, positions uh, in universities like Stanford University, University of Liechtenstein and um, CAS London and many others. Um, so I'm looking forward to welcome you here, Lars. Thank you so much for making it. Thank you very much, Denis. Uh, really appreciate to be here today and uh, Enlightened to talk about uh, MBank and our fintech uh, story and how we uh, really uh, transferred how bank can be operated. And uh, I'm always surprised day by day how many things coming up new in the fintech market and uh, that really not only, not only the ones building banks, uh, but also the one running and also the end consumer, every one of us which has a bank account is appreciating the new services coming up on the market. So. Happy to uh, be with you here and answer your questions. Thank you so much. So I want to start by the, um, well, uh, you, you have a fantastic background, both academic and, and uh, as well, technological and, and financial. So I would like to talk, how did you get into the industry, but as well, a bit of your background, because you, you've been around the world. But I think it's always good to be a bit of a cultural background and the education and how did you come into the industry? Well, I mean, things started with computer science, obviously. Uh, 1981, I was one of the younger guys having computer. Uh, those days, it was not normal that you had them standing in your house. Uh, my father was in a uh, chief executive role for one of the biggest uh, companies here in Europe, uh, digital equipment, uh, later uh, Compaq, HP, we all know them. So uh, he had the ability to bring me home those mainframe boxes uh, our con con consumption of uh, energy was as much as a, as a small factory those days, but he let me experiment and use the computer as much as I wanted. So I, my, my childhood, my teenage years have been really 
what you would call nowadays hacking years and nerdy years. I was really into the computers. I studied in computer science with business administration on top of it. And um, getting out of it that I said, I don't want to touch any computer anymore. Um, but life is not uh, always fair to you. So I started with uh, at Corpus Cop Library, which then later became PwC uh, as a consultant for process reengineering. The second process reengineering project used to be one for an SAP implementation at a bank. And actually, it was the first SAP implementation at a bank. Uh, we co-developed uh, still parts of the solution there. And uh, as uh, my role was to align the processes I see in all those other guys sitting at a computer, not knowing how to code it. So then I jumped in and said, you know what, I showed how the things are done a little bit easier. And right, coincidence was they said, if you are so good with it, then you should stay with it. And uh, as I was then the first one, having had SAP implementation done in the bank, obviously uh, within very quick, uh, fast track, I, I could achieve the next level within consulting. I was the only one did this before, one, one of the few, uh, then I could spread my knowledge in, in, in high level roles, uh, advising uh, executives on, is this the right way to go with SAP and so on, right? Uh, driven out of that, I managed to go to Accenture, uh, ended up there as senior executive and uh, had a big span of control there. Went very international, did many projects around the globe for banks. But uh, at SAP, it was more interesting in the kind of in, 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 in the engineering areas. I did also projects for SIBA, uh, chemical company, uh, X, uh, uh, Alcatel, high tech company. I was uh, BMW involved. So it was across all kinds of industries, which uh, helped me to gain, let's say, quite big picture of uh, how things are done in different industries, right? And when I was ending up as MD at Deutsche Bank, responsible for their uh, lending solutions globally, uh, been there and also majorly involved in the in the change of uh, their uh, custom built solutions towards SAP, um, I really realized that, well. It's the same as pieces system I worked 20 years before to it. And um, even some of my staff found some remarks codes, which been written by me in my first very first project and said, hey, can it be that you coded that solution one time before? Um, sounds funny story, but actually it was very sad because it uh, means that even nowadays, those solutions, uh, Oracle, SAP, uh, and so on and so on, there are other solutions prior to internet, uh, internet was coming mid nineties uh, upright. So there are pre-internet solutions, which are in continuously a little bit evolved, but still using the old database structures and stuff. So that's why we said, okay, we have to do things different and uh, how can we do it? So we, we start a new company. And uh, well, with my friend, uh, Vlad Dunigov, uh, I met on a business trip uh, on check by coincidence and I call it serendipity of life that you meet each other. Uh, we quickly figured out that there must be a market for it to uh, put everything a bank needs into one platform, but using a completely different data architecture, right? Um, today, and even when we started five, six, seven years back, the biggest challenge for all banks are keeping up with the regulatory changes and requirements. And uh, so a key investment of all the banks are running into that area instead of into innovations, right? And why are regulators so harsh on it? Obviously, we found it out of, after 2008, after the banking crisis, uh, while they uh, then more and more found out that because of that many IT systems and spread data all across the, the banks and financial institutes, there is no common view about what, 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 what is uh, accessible, right? So there might be treasury looks into different data than the risk and uh, the business. So and that was the key for us to start in banking to say, there is a way we can tackle it, we can re-engineer it, we can use different algorithms and bring it from pre-internet to uh, an area of uh, era of uh, where we have smartphones, where we have digital solutions and so on, right? And just to summarize it, what do we do different? I mean, many banks still think digitalization means you have mobile front ends, you have mobile apps, but we think digitalization is in the back end how the solution should run. So we use big data algorithms. We have an entire bank, a mob platform. We have uh, non-disrupted data flows. We never change the data. We never accumulate and save it back to the database. We always uh, process on the event transaction when, when it happened at the bank, which gives us very flexible and very agile. And uh, obviously with the new IT infrastructure, we can, can achieve this kind of tremendous success there. So that, that was just the key where we started, right?
No, and it's a fantastic uh, journey as well from, I think, from the beginning of the internet to the beginning of fintech as we know it until the revolution that we're going through. So can you, um, so you you started with the, well, big names, like you just mentioned, from PwC to Accenture and then Deutsche Bank to create your own uh, financial uh, organization and fintech bank. So can you tell us a bit how do you saw this part of your career and the challenge you saw as well working for big multinationals and then creating your own fintech uh, startup that right now is one of the, the fast growing fintech organizations as well worldwide? Well, I, I think it's always to do with the, the time, at the, the 90s when I started. I started uh, mid 90s uh, with working right. And the most desirable job those days been in consulting because it's in different things and you can learn from different limitations. You run every three months a new project somewhere else in the world. You come around, you see different cities. It was very appealing for me. So I could uh, combine my interest in, let's say, finding about different cultures and having the national projects. And at the same time, I learned a lot about what we're doing there with the uh, you know, subject area. My subject area was banking and IT, right? And um, then I think, uh, obviously, when you do this for um, for many years, 15 years, then, then there's a jump to say, okay, you want to see the other side of, of the industry, from consulting to be, become a member of one of your clients, which obviously with the MD position at Deutsche Bank was uh, the pinnacle of, uh, of, of what I could achieve at that time, right? And uh, even today, probably, Deutsche Bank is uh, Champions League, and uh, if you are all the way up at the top of it, obviously, it's kind of interesting to run this role. Um, but clearly, if you have an entrepreneurial heart in yourself, you always think about what is my next project, what can I do? And I know many people which are going back home from the work said, I want to do my own company, start my own thing. And um, many of the fintechs today uh, started out of this uh, encouragement. So no wonder uh, it was just a matter of time to, to start MBank, right? Um, why did I leave uh, Deutsche Bank? Obviously, it was the time where I had a little child. I seen the first step of my daughter on a WhatsApp video so that I said, there must be more in life to do than this. I achieved what I wanted to achieve. I've been on the top of, 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 of the industry level. Um, I left Deutsche Bank. I was traveling a lot with my daughter and my wife. And at the same time, I was, was studying uh, business psychology and executive coaching to learn more about the human aspect of, uh, of what drives us all to, to become who we are and what values are given to us through the parents and uh, which of the values we're passing on to our child, right? So after graduating there, after being back, like, like say on the market to, to earn some money instead of just spending it for studying and traveling, I, I had really this coincidence that I met Vlad Dunikov to, to start and bank together, right? So, and um, then my entrepreneurial heart was there. I, I knew about people and I think MBank is built as a company where I really value very much every individual person um, we started from beginning on very international. We started out of the, the Silicon Valley as a headquarter, but we understood if you start from scratch, it would take us 20 years to have a solid, solid solution. So we acquired a company in Europe. Um, but we've always been driving right away quite fast. And we, we go then, went in, in the first year already to Cambodia to increase their uh, development team. We went to Singapore, started an accelerator. Uh, but the key focus on the line, red line, was always. Uh, human resource and, and, and trying to care about the values of our uh, employer em, em, employees and also about ourselves, right? And talk openly about emotions and things like this. So MBank is a fintech which sets up and operates banks for clients using digital banking platform software as a service. So can you tell us how it works and um, some of the case studies? I think when we talk about fintech we try to be very uh, i think bigger but there's so much cases and fantastic case studies that create a lot of solutions mm -hmm. to problems okay. and i would like to understand for people listening to us how it works and some of the some case studies that you want to probably to share to share with us so yeah of, co of course i mean we, we we didn't think too much about fintech itself we just thought we, there is a, a problem we have a solution for it right and uh, with what I explained before, with our data model, we could achieve this, that we probably run banks on a smarter way, on a faster way. And um, but, but key for us was also that we wanted to migrate existing banks. We didn't want to just offer a digital bank solution for neo banks, because even five, six years back, those big players like Revolut and 26 and so on, they've been existing, 
but uh, they hardly made some profits out of it uh, because the products they have run in the platform are kind of not very margin driven projects uh, products right so um, we started to migrate a couple of projects and um, existing banks uh, their platforms 30 40 euros uh, old uh, it is quite successful, but uh, then more and more demand came to say, okay, let's use this platform for new banks. And as we did this more and more often, we then right away recognized there was a market for banking as a service. So we needed to that our own banking license or a banking license we can provide to our clients. But we also need underlying services. So we added compliance, regulatory, disbursement, lending as a service, and so on. We have payment as a service. We have... Uh, uh, credit card licenses, visa licenses, uh, bank licenses, as I said, with payment rails, ACH, SEPA, SWIFT. Uh, we have connectors to uh, blockchain uh, exchanges. Uh, so there are many things together as a platform, but with the services too, so we have the teams to run all those operations a bank would do. Matter of fact, MBank, many people think we are a bank, no, we are a service provider, but we run everything a bank would run too. So we have all the services a bank operates. Which we can offer then as a market and then and, and a service to our existing clients, right? So I'm talking about this. Uh, I just mentioned we had an accelerator program out of Singapore, which is still very successful, and we had uh, dozens of clients uh, or not clients, sorry, uh, cohorts running and rising with it, and incubated incubated them, uh, accelerated them. We had them with investor connectivity. We had them with uh, obviously with the product itself, if the if the market goes towards. So, um, so we learn a lot about fintech and about uh, what, uh, let's say, the market demand is, right? And uh, what our, what our, uh, what our cohorts, our clients, our existing other uh, banks and the neo banks would need as a service. So we interconnect the whole ecosystem, and and see it as one 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 part to manage. So one of the things that M Bank is uh, quite innovative is the the focus in creating banking as a service, so BAS, um, that is mostly uh, relating with traditional banks, such as banks, and then bank enables it to create digital business scenarios. And as well, uh, innovation like credit union as a service, or even regulatory as a service and compliance as a service, which are very important to think right now when it comes to the new iteration of digital business, especially in financial business. So can you elaborate some of these case studies? I think it's very important for people listening to us because I think this, of course, for people in the B2B market and more in financial markets and technology, this is kind of an achievement or at least that we know about this, but most of the people don't have a clue about this, even most of the banks, let's put it that way. So I would like to, for you to elaborate a bit about this and of course the, the innovation that comes out of M Bank. Okay, uh, sure, sure, certainly. Um... You know, Vlad and myself, we both have a background in PwC and in Big Four. So we grown up with compliance and regulatory, and uh, we understood quite well that's one of the key manifestums of, uh, of, of banking, right, and, and financial services. And uh, we also understood, obviously, when we did banking as a service, we got demand from credit unions, but the credit unions have a completely different structure in America. They have uh, very different terms. Um, and also the way they operate is uh, quite distinctive uh, differently, right? So we said, okay, we have to, in order to address the compliance of both of them, we have two different products. Uh, it sounds like almost the same, just different name, but it's really indeed, uh, if you go inside there, it's a quite different product that we go to market with, right? Uh, but one of one commonality all of them have, they have to be compliant and uh, regulatory in corresponding uh, in any time given. And uh, that's why we said, okay, if we onboard new clients, which we never knew about, neo banks, startup banks, uh, we have to emphasize really on their requirements quite strongly because one of those clients will probably push our whole company in, in, in some of risk. But that's why we said, okay, let's take it away that we build up the service ourselves. We have uh, XKPMG, Ernst Young, GWC, and so on uh, on board. So we have to write big four background there, uh, people which understand this market business entries. We have people from ex banks in those regulatory areas so that we can offer it as a service to our clients. And with this, we do two things. Obviously, we have a service offered. The second, we control the risk. And um, I always say, if you're not compliant anymore, you can take the name bank out of your logo because otherwise, uh, um, that's what everyone expects when he puts the money in a bank. It has to be banked and it has to be safe, right? And uh, the, the name impl implicates it. You put it on the bank, right? And uh, 
Therefore, we're doing this quite quite severe and to take it very serious here. Um, other services then around is uh, also to do with uh, KYC, uh, with the monitoring of transactions, with uh, risk management around uh, just the, the, the way. So it's really ongoing service uh, which we offer for our customers to be compliant at any given time. And so that's very, yeah. So, yeah. so let, let me touch one, one question. Sorry, I want to go more. So I think the idea of banking as a service, so I think that's very ambitious. And uh, I think at the moment we have a, a part of legacy systems mixed with a very revolutionary, and I have a couple of questions on that level, but so can you just elaborate more on this particular part? For instance, let's say if I'm a small bank around the world, how this is changing banking? Because this, I think this is going to be probably the most revolutionary part of this stage of financial industry worldwide. Well, it completely changes it, obviously, because a small bank now, you know, would never have the, the resources to be compliant at any given time, because it's really the, the law novels are coming every single day. There is always every single day an update for any jurisdiction, obviously. The, the jurisdictions in, in if you talk to the US, it's about every state has their own jurisdiction and then there's a federal jurisdictions behind and legislative behind. And the same if you look at MBank as a global company, every country we're going in, we have to understand the regulations there, right? Uh, so that's why it's a kind of an extensive pro project and service to uh, understand the requirements and then also put these requirements in an aspect that you can bring it back to your client through the solution we're offering, right? And it's not only IT and the process behind the IT, it's also the service around it, right? There's a lot of paperwork involved. There's a lot of uh, reporting involved, obviously, which has to be driven. But there's also dialogue involved that you talk to the regulators and keep to manage, uh, let's say, the expectations, but also manage somehow how regulation can change in the future. Um, um, we had many times the case that regulators that are very close to us, that some of our clients give even the portal to open up to the regulators um, that they can go into their bank, whatever they want in any given time and, and look for what they want to look. Uh, obviously that builds a lot of trust, uh, but also builds the ability that you are driving regulations and future laws in a certain attempt, right? And say, okay, this might be um, easing up how regulators can control the market. Um, Looking now for the fintechs area in the crypto space, it's unregulated as we know today, but more and more regulations are thought of about. There is more and more uh, drive in this direction. How a um, future regulative uh, jurisdiction can probably control the market and control uh, banking in, in the crypto space. Um, we talk to many of regulations right now to set the, 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 the target lines there. Um, and, and give a guideline, how could this be achieved in a way that it still has the freedom of what crypto is about, but uh, kind of uh, gives control and also with control, I talk about the trust of end users into this kind of uh, operations, right? Uh, this is uh, very, very powerful stuff, especially for the next stage of uh, the banking industry and, and the, actually for the financial industry and for every one of us because this touches everything we do. So I want to touch one thing that is particularly important. So, so you, you are working, so you are a Silicon Valley bank uh, that very as well based as well in Switzerland and uh, like you mentioned with operations as well in Singapore, so quite a global bank. But the challenge we have right now is definitely on one end is the technological uh, pace, which most of the banks are challenged. You know, on the end, it's geographies and all the things related to geographies. And, and of course, right now we're going through some geopolitical, not some very important geopolitical uh, nuances. And then on the third part is that we have as well the, the blockchain revolution going deeply on the, I would say anything in, in the world economy, but especially in financial industry. And then they talk about blockchain we have areas like decentralized finance centralized finance and especially as well the areas of crypto the areas of digital and for instance, there's a bit of a paradox that for instance you can actually quite easily send one million dollars on crypto from one place to the other without anyone having track record of that but if you want to send ten thousand dollars from your bank to another bank is a complete nightmare and normally the fees get lost and for instance a uh, I had cases of transfers between one country to the other and the next in the Western world taking two weeks. 
and uh, you don't know where the money is. Uh, and when the money comes, you don't know. So I would like to touch this part because I know that uh, banks like yours and organizations like yours are trying to solve these problems. But the reality is that we are kind of exceptions still. Uh, although the quantity of money, especially coming to crypto is right now two trillion plus, uh, which is a quite substantial chunk of the world economy. Yes. But most of the people are still in financial retail, kind of very traditional parts. So I would like to see how you see these different challenges. It's quite a big question, but I know that you have quite a lot of uh, mm -hmm. oversee and as well insights about this. Um, uh, great topic. Uh, one thing I learned the last five years and we met not only big banks, we met a lot of high net worth uh, individual people. Um, the biggest issue right now is sending money from one place to the other place. Uh, why is an issue? Because you always have to um, declare where's the money coming from, how did, did you earn it, and so on and so on. So frozen bank accounts are quite a normal thing nowadays, and it takes really time to not only open up an account or release a, a payment uh, within SWIFT, right? And uh, background checks are done at the same time, uh, while uh, you have to bring more paperwork and so on and so on. Oh, that's a really, really quite challenging task, which uh, sourced out of all the anti-money laundering uh, initiatives, but also fraud, fraud, fraudulent uh, processes, which are unfortunately existing all over the world, right? And that's why fiat, uh, fiat exchanges is kind of so such a nasty task. Um, People think sometimes that the bank is working with your money when it takes three or four days to send it from left to right. But uh, matter in fact, it's really the, the process behind. Um, Swift is not uh, really designed the way that you earn money with the money sitting on your account. It's really about understanding where the money comes from and to fulfill regulatory requirements. Um, there are new models coming up uh, using stable coins. We developed one together with IBM a while ago. Um, but the challenge is that within within milliseconds, you have then to make distinguished uh, analytics on top of it. Most of them are artificial intelligence based, that you run the same transaction monitoring process behind, you run the same kind of compliance checks behind, which is, uh, being quite honest, not that easy to do this in three seconds and, and uh, the traditional process takes three days, right? So when I talk about crypto, why crypto allows it, I mean, crypto is not not a currency. Crypto is uh, called a currency, but it's not a currency, in, not in any jurisdiction in the world. It's not regulated. It's partially regulated, but not as a currency. It's just uh, as an asset regulated. And uh, therefore, you can change an asset in a different way. Uh, some countries are thinking about putting customs on it because you send one asset to the other market. That's the same what you would do if you sell a motorbike or a car from one place to the other. Some others are thinking about pushing harder regulations on it. But matter of fact, it's still not uh, defined as a, as a currency and uh, not any as, a, as, an, as anything else than, let's say, as a legal asset. Some of them don't even declare it as an asset. So it's there's still a kind of a gap how to send money from one place to the other using uh, blockchain. But obviously, you have the down path of you, you send crypto and the and the, um, the, 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 the currency could go up and down in, in those three, four milliseconds on a tremendous amount. So never the same money arrives than what you expected to, to send, right? So there is there is still not the, the right solution for it, I think. Um, I hear that the market's going to find a solution for it itself. Uh, my personal opinion is Regulators will try it from all over the world, but the power of crypto is so strong that we will see one global currency very soon. Personally, I don't believe it's uh, the Bitcoin. I think the Bitcoin is too much a Ponsky scheme than a feasible currency. I think it's uh, non, uh, not stable enough to be a feasible currency, but uh, we will see something like this. And uh, one question to you, then is, I mean, if you think about uh, why would you uh, avoid having, let's say, Bitcoin as a as a main currency? You probably would tell me, well, it's because it's volatile and tomorrow it's more valuable than tomorrow, or the day after, right? Um, but if I would tell you, you know what, you will earn your money in, in Bitcoin, you would spend it in Bitcoin, in that moment, volatility doesn't matter anymore because you always have the same amount of Bitcoin you spend and receive, right? As long as the prices are stable behind. 
And if you consider this in your mindset, then you probably would come to the answer, okay, there must be a, a way to, to utilize uh, any kind of cryptocurrency if it gives me this kind of trustful relation for it. And it's all about to do with trust, nothing else than this, right? No, I'm completely with you. And I think this is probably the biggest challenge we have for the next, I would say, two generations, because in one end, we have uh, all the innovation that is coming from organizations like yours that are shifting and helping conventional and traditional finance. But the point is that we have already the two worlds working together and actually intertwining, because a huge part of the, the, the cryptocurrencies movement right now and all the blockchain innovation is being done by the biggest players in the world. Uh, for instance, if you look at blockchain as a service from Amazon, mm. from Microsoft, from uh, even Oracle, all these are the biggest tech companies in the world. <clears throat> and this is on the technology side, but then we have all <clears throat> the process of tokenization, the process of digitalization. So I, I think for me, the challenge, and I think this is another question for you, but I'm trying to put it in a bit more more organization is, let, let's, let's go back to what you said about Bitcoin. So. I actually did an experiment of paying my organization for one year in in Bitcoin. And actually, I managed to put 20 people around the world being paid by Bitcoin. And I traveled for one year exclusively using a Visa card, actually, that was powered by Visa. Um, and I literally paid everything. So actually, it works. Okay, And there's a lot of people. For instance, mm -hmm. I think we, you and me are in Europe. But if you are working in another country... Um, for as I interview one of the biggest organizations, I'm not mentioning names, and they could not send money to some people in some of the countries where they live. And for instance, if you live in a country that has some kind of regime that is not so conventional or has more issues with financial stability or emergencies, well, this becomes more important than all the stuff that you have. So, so we have already a paradox that the world economy is talking mm -hmm. about one thing, but the real economy is already intertwined. I remember even my first real when I created the bank in, in 2000, it was already 2014. This is, was a long time ago. Uh, I'm talking in terms of crypto. And uh, at the time in Africa, in some of the countries we're doing operations, there was already a substantial percentage of population that were actually using Bitcoin. And this was 2014 by uh, people listening to us. I'm not talking 2016, 17 or 18. We are in 2022. And at the time, there was a huge percentage of population that were using it because it was more stable than the local currencies. And if you if you work, for instance, with that in Argentina or in Latin America, of course, this becomes more relevant, especially if you work in tech industry. So I think the challenge coming back to you right now, the bank is, <clears throat> how are you looking at this? Because of course you are working with traditional big banks and of course we need these banks because we need stability. And I think for us, when you talk about decentralization, and it's a big question, but it's more a, a interaction with you is there's as well, this is official numbers is that we're talking about decentralization but uh, these official numbers is that 2000 around 2000 wallets even less than that control probably 90 percent of the digital currencies or cryptocurrencies in the planet so it's much more centralized <laughs> than all the banking industry together so it's, it's a lot of paradoxes here but i think this is going to be yeah i think my question probably to try to summarize is how how we can actually cope with all of these things i think technology wise you are prepared for that and you are leading the wave. But I think it's, it's probably on the psychological and as well on the economical side, because that means at a certain point, we're creating multiple parallel realities of economical wealth and economical ecosystems, which sure. is partly what is happening right now. Well, well very, very good uh, findings here. Uh, first of all, quickly to finalize the thing about the you paid people in, 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 in crypto or in Bitcoin. Obviously, if you could have spent in Bitcoin at the same time, it would have been much more stable and much more attractive. We don't have to have a conversion between. Uh, but saying what you said about what's coming up now with uh, with all the tech technology around tokenization, I mean, that's impressive. We ourselves, we are involved in that quite well. We have clients building a bank with us. They do tokenizing. We have um, numerous uh, clients actually, which are doing uh, tokenizations right now and using also our bank infrastructure to offer a wallet behind it. Uh, but I think uh, we look now in a, in a way that I see many more companies right now, which would in a classical sense look for an IPO, but probably they cannot go for an IPO because they're way too small for it. They look now for a private uh, token offering or something like this, or a direct uh, token offering. 
which says, okay, we tokenize our company. We put it, make a digital asset out of it, a digital security out of it. I and mean, this digital security, first of all, the only thing we do, we convert it instead of shares, we, talk, we convert it into tokens. Those share tokens we hold in ourselves. And obviously it's kind of interesting what you can do with those tokens. You can take a number of tokens, go with it to the market and uh, place it for crowdfunding, for example, right? Uh, you can leverage quite uh, easily and quite interestingly uh, with the right assets around uh, to raise funds in a quite significant amount. Um, funny wise, this part of crypto business is quite regulated. Uh, in the US especially, the SEC was setting up the, the REC licenses, uh, REC A, REC A+, uh, REC CF, REC D, there's so many different ones for institutional, semi-institutional, or private investors for crowdfunding initiatives. So it's a quite interesting instrument how you can fund uh, rise your funds in a, in, a, in, a, in a modern way. And obviously, once you have then a certain amount of people using those tokens, it's up to you how you control them, right? Do they all, can you offer it on a public market or not? Obviously, the volatility might go up and down, uh, or you want to keep it more stable. Uh, when you enclose the trading market and probably allow trading on your, on your own website, then you have more control of it and it probably the volatility goes out. You might not rise that fast, but you don't want it. You have more stability. The second thing where it leads to is obviously that we will disrupt not only the financial market from the, from the banking perspective, but also from the trading perspective. So if more and more companies going this way to be digital security, you obviously find a way that you have uh, alternative trading server solutions and services coming up, which act more or less like a stock exchange, even though it's more than a crypto exchange in the platform in the background. And um, this is the way where I say you see more complex tokens coming up, more probably tokenized ETFs coming up, which are very interesting to uh, invest into, but also uh, which gives you more, uh, let's say, for smaller companies, more ability to raise funds fast and to grow faster, right? So these are really valuable assets coming on the market, uh, which use a valuable new trading exchange platform uh, for the future. And that's why I'm a strong believer that the common stock exchange and stock markets, as you see it right now, as the heavy lift companies on top of this, well, we will see disrupting them quite quite significantly, right? There might be name, namely big uh, names on it, on, on the platforms, but I think the no-name mid-side markets are going more and more to the digital security assets uh, and trading solutions. I'm completely, and I think, I think it's going to be this kind of economy of scale is going to be massive. And I think the challenge right now is some of these economies are becoming bigger than actually entire countries. So it's, we're starting to create a lot of uh, things. So we could go for hours on this. So I want to, um, we are passing close to one hour. So, so Lars, one of the things I would like to touch. So you have part of your um, and bank, which is quite uh, ex exceptional, what you guys are doing is, you have a lot of innovation services. So I know that uh, some of the things that you mentioned, we touched so from banking as a service to credit union as a service and as well regulatory and compliance, but you have as well a lot of things in cloud computing and stuff like that. I know that is quite technical. Not everyone in our audience has this knowledge, but I would like to touch this as well. I think especially for the geeks listening mm -hmm. to us, because I think it's, okay. it's an area that I think my, my interviews are always master classes for people listening to us. So I think it's a great opportunity to learning from people like you. So if you can touch some of the services, especially in cloud computing and explain a bit how it works for people listening to us and people that want to come into this industry. Because we always normally look at the negative, but there's thousands of jobs being created around these areas. And this is definitely some of the things that are not so dependent of the political and geopolitical parts. It's pure technology and very necessary for all our economic systems. Well, of course, I mean, cloud computing, I mean, everyone does it nowadays uh, on your private phones. You have probably an I iCloud or you have a Google Cloud, whatever device you're using to back up your data there. And uh, we don't care much where it sits. We just rely on it and trust that whoever takes care of my data is doing it in a trustful way, right? Uh, with the bank, it gets a different paradigm, obviously. A bank, it has trustful information on it. It should be unhackable. So obviously, uh, we trust... Uh, on, on our cloud solution on AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services as a provider, uh, but also obviously we encrypt all the data in, in, in many different ways so that we have double, triple, quadruple security on top of it. Advantage of cloud computing is quite easy. It's uh, completely managed as a service behind. I don't have to put my computers up in the basement anymore. 
Um, I don't have to take uh, care about uh, where is my uh, disaster recovery solution. I can book this with a click of a button at AWS or at Google or Amazon, whatever service uh, or Microsoft, whatever service I'm using, or any third party, any other, namely well done computing center. They take care of this for, for you. And uh, so we have not only a maintenance and productive environment, we have also a disaster recovery, means a copy of whatever is done in a different entity. Different jurisdiction, most like different country, different different computing center anywhere else in the world, right? And the uh, biggest advantage, obviously, is that you can scale it. You bring scalability inside. You can start small, just pay a little bit. But the more you grow as your entity grows, the service behind grows too. They can dynamically put more processing power behind the solutions. So it means if your bank needs more processing and computing power, then you just goes naturally up and. Uh, or the demand, even 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 on a, on a certain time, let's say you you're running your financial reports at the end of the year, in that moment, then Amazon would give us just more computing power, right, and the process faster for us. So this has numerous so service uh, advantages, obviously, um, and uh, but it's also limited in sense of a bank and fintech on your jurisdictional requirements and uh, approvals. So there are many countries in the world which don't allow cloud computing for banks. Some of them restricted, say. Let's, for example, Europe say the computing uh, center must be anywhere in the European Union, otherwise not allowed to use this environment. So you cannot host your data anywhere in the US when your bank is a European bank. Um, the other way around is the same, basically. Um, but then there are some also some areas where there is no nothing like AWS uh, available. So you cannot even put uh, the bank up on a platform even if you would like to because they don't have to service in this country. So that's why we decided the way that we use AWS as native instance, but we also have MBank Sky and other solution up, which we are then flexible with what computing center we use. It can be anywhere in the cloud, but it can also be even in the, in the basement if this jurisdiction requires it. So some jurisdiction really requires that the bank itself is taking care of the data and they run their own computing center. But more and more, it goes towards cloud computing, obviously, right? Well, completely, and I think this is a really big thing because it's just such a AWS is, is, is Amazon, which is right now starting to own a huge part of the financial industry worldwide. For people thinking about that, so another actually the biggest yeah. one on the financial service spectrum is AWS right now, more than Microsoft or anyone else, right? And even uh, yes. Red Hat, IBM, those big ones uh, are not just keeping that scale up, uh, especially if you see every day there are a, a thousand new fintech companies registered anywhere in the world. So the growth is phenomenal behind it, right? Now, Kupuri, and I think this is really very important to highlight for people listening to us, and especially for this mystifying these things. So I want to uh, touch one of the things that's quite innovative that you're talking, and uh, I think people didn't hear too much, but you, you, you created as well a solution that is the IBM Worldwide Payments, <clears throat> okay. uh, IBM Blockchain Worldwide. Uh, that is a financial rail that simultaneously clears and settles cross-border payments in near real time. So can you can you highlight on this? Because it's quite innovative, and I think it's one of the most important sure. things that that people need. Everyone on this, I would sure. like to hear your uh, uh, your your views about this. I yeah. talked a bit about in my uh, when we talked about the, the payment rails uh, a couple of minutes ago. So more or less exactly this, what I said, you know, Swift takes three days to send money from left to right, and there must be better ways using it. So together with IBM, we thought about how can we do this? Uh, obviously, we wanted to use blockchain technology. We use a stellar stable coin uh, in operation, it means we convert uh, a certain fiat amount and send it electronically over to the other side of the world and deconvert it. This technology part is quite easy. I mean, everyone who a little bit is interested in computer could probably achieve this within an afternoon. But the difficulty is really to do the background checks behind it, do the transaction monitoring, do the KYC of uh, sender and receiver, beneficiary and sender. So it's, it's uh, it, it, it's kind of really the trick is in the detail and behind it, how you are compliant to send fiat uh, money from one place to the other, right? So you have to do all the background checks and so on. And the way uh, we tackle it here is using artificial intelligence, doing pre-assessment about characteristic of persons, probably even save some metadata of uh, people behind uh, of some uh, payment flows to uh, achieve 100% uh, reliability that every payment has the right matter and uh, the right purpose and uh, the money sent is illegal money. 
It's a very innovative area, and I think it's going to be probably the most important thing, especially for people that work between countries in different areas. So, um, uh, as a wrap up question, and I would like to hear about so, especially you have uh, quite a lot of experience you mentioned about the labs and as well about the, the accelerator that you created as well. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of I know that one of the areas of passion for you is education and uh, coaching and the areas of uh, bringing this knowledge to a lot of more people. So can you tell us about that? Because it's one of the areas that we try to do here is the financial literacy okay. or digital literacy, but as well in this case, FinTech literacy, which is key uh, for everyone listening, especially people that come to our podcast and for everyone around the world. So I think if you could highlight your work on these areas, you have a fantastic uh, CV that touches a lot of areas. You've been involved as well. For people that uh, can check your profile, you have been involved as well as executive sponsor and co-founder of the Stein Bias Training. And um, that is an intercultural inter academy. So you have a huge part from MBank, but as well on the personal level. So if you could yeah, teach yeah. a bit about, uh, about that for us. I, I love the tutoring. So I'm, I, I like to stand in front of uh, younger people and motivate them and inspire, uh, inspire them and give them a little bit, let's say, help and, and, and tell them about the pitfalls I was stepping into. Uh, and uh, also, obviously, when you're together with young people, you learn from them too. So it's a two-way street here. And from the beginning on, we said at MBank, we want to have an accelerator um, to grow our ecosystem around, right? Use our system, we give our system as a platform to our cohorts, and then they can build solutions around it, right? Um, obviously, we started out of Singapore on the INSEAD Fontainebleau uh, premise. That was our office located, or is our office located. And uh, we've been running then six, eight, 12 cohorts every year through that, through that program, right? And um, we give masterclasses there. We, we help them with uh, certain areas about, let's say, what, what any startup has to tackle, like uh, how do I get uh, make, make, a, make a smart, uh, let's say, set up the companies? How do I deal with investors? How I split my, my shares? How do I do this with taxes and all this stuff involved there? But also then we, we can obviously make master glasses that our existing banks, clients, this might be traditional banks, 50 years, 100 years old, but also let's say neo banks, new startup banks, uh, giving master glasses about their experience working with us, but also working with the, with the new world coming up together, right? So really span up whoever we have in the ecosystem of MBank. And um, we did any kind of uh, fintech there. We had fintechs which have been based uh, more around, let's say, uh, the crypto space, um, tokenizing companies and so on. But we also have classical banks, neo banks, which participate here. Um, right now, we're looking for 24 new cohorts in the US. Um, they will be all neo bank initiatives uh, starting with us. Um, we have very direct drift packages. So the best of our cohorts, uh, we get uh, heavily discounts in our solutions but even a financial assist package so that the first two years are kind of supported strongly by MBank. The first two years, the most important one that you get, get going, that you can go, uh, let's say, a little step faster, which means it's a financial advantage, but it's also the advantage that we can probably reach out to, to our clients to connect the new service to the existing platform, uh, but also connect to the real market to find customers quite quickly, right? And quite interestingly, uh, even though, the past was probably more the national right now, but this year we focus really on the US market. Um, we have people from all over the world starting here. Uh, we have uh, Australians uh, from islands of Tonga, from uh, Dubai, from Europe, from all over the world, people starting with us neobanks in the US, right? And that's something probably would never someone had thought about it. Someone from the other side of the world started a new bank with us in the US and really is successful with it. Um, so, Things are possible nowadays. Uh, uh, I think the pandemic was very helpful for it. People learn to think about um, working online on the other side of the globe. Um, we had advantage, we did this from beginning on with our global setup, uh, rolling out banks internationally without even being stepping on, 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 the, on, on that country. Um, but even that's something our learnings we give then on in, 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 the, in, the, in the master classes throughout the, the course of the accelerator program. Yeah, I think this is definitely for me one of the key elements for all of us because we need to keep continuously coaching. And I think platforms like yours is not, I think any business is, is really an ecosystem. And the way we build these ecosystems is the way we can actually create a lot of value. 
but it's also created a lot of potential bridges between different knowledge and different things. So as a wrap up, and I think we passed one hour, and this is quite a very technical interview. So um, thank you so much, Lars. But the, what uh, for people listening to us, where they can find more about you, about MBank, and some of the things you want to share with our audience, we'll put all the links to to the website, to the different programs sure. that you have. And but I would like to to listen a bit more about that. Absolutely. I mean, um, always accessible. I like to share the stories and go in details. I like to be a sparing partner for new ideas. So if there is a fintech or someone want to build a fintech, um, please contact me. Uh, you find me on LinkedIn, obviously. You can find us on mbank.com. Um, I'm 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 there. I'm there for you to be a sparing partner and 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 spin your thoughts right and around. Thank you. So. For people listening to us, please go to the, the profiles of uh, Lars uh, and Bank and actually engage because definitely this is, I think, uh, the most important thing, especially for the people that are interested in, in the areas of technology and banking and financial services. But I think for everyone, I think we all need to learn these things. So Lars, thank you so much. Congratulations for your achievements with MBank. I know that it's not easy to do what you guys are doing. And as well for the work that you've been doing as well on the coaching and training, which I'm always eager myself to learn. Thank you. You should participate in one of our masterclasses. Thank you very much, Denise, for having me today. And uh, keep it going. I love your videos and hope to see many, many more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.